tell us who you are and how you became famous for being the Forbes columnist who was canceled over Anthony Fauci. So first off, Allison, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so I founded OpenTheBooks.com. Our simple mission is every dime online in real time. And last year to that end, we filed 47,000 Freedom of Information Act requests on nearly every single substantial public body in the entire country. We successfully captured $12 trillion worth of federal, state, and local spending. We display it all for free so everybody listening to the podcast can come to OpenTheBooks.com. And you can even see the salaries within your K-12 through school district. We, uh, we post that online. And nothing like this has ever been done before. Uh, no one's ever filed tens of thousands of FOIAs and captured trillions of dollars of spending. So we're, we're unique in the space. And this is kind of what it looks like, right? So you you have quite a search engine here for people if they want to use it as well. What why did I what happened with Forbes? Tell me about that. And when did you start looking into Fauci? I guess I should I should take you back a little bit to that. So with Dr. Anthony Fauci, you know, we determined about 16 months ago in January of 2021 that he was the number one most highly compensated federal employee. And also over the course of the last two years, it's not in dispute, he's had the biggest influence in United States healthcare policy and drove the policy during the pandemic. So it's incumbent upon all of us to give him oversight. When we found that he out earned the president of the United States, four-star generals in the United States military, and all 4.3 million of his colleagues at the federal level, we had questions as to how. How does Anthony Fauci out earn all of them? And that kicked off a massive investigation. We simply filed Freedom of Information Act requests. At every turn, we were stonewalled by the National Institutes of Health. We had to file expensive lawsuits. You know, on the other side, they're funded by taxpayers. We, mm -hmm. uh, we helped drive the issue into a hearing in the United States Senate where Dr. Fauci misled Congress, misled the American people, and had the meltdown on national television. Allison, you'll remember just a few months ago when he called U.S. Senator Roger Marshall from Kansas a moron on the hot mic. That was because of our oversight work on Dr. Anthony Fauci's finances. It may take you a while to get through some of the investigations into the NIH and Dr. Anthony Fauci, so you'll probably get thirsty, which is why you should go to allisonwinepromo.com and get 50% off some amazing Malbecs from Argentina that also allow you to support my work, and you get 50% off shipping as well. The trio includes two wines from almost 9,000 feet. They're considered extreme altitude wines, so they have a very unique flavor because of the elevation. The grapes work much harder under the sun, so there's a unique flavor, more antioxidants and you get to support my work at the same time can't get any wines like this at the grocery store and you definitely aren't going to get them when you submit a FOIA to the federal government but if you are a coffee drinker check out twinenginecoffee.com slash allison and also tea there's a Katura tea you can try but there's a wide variety of USDA certified organic Nicaraguan rose there's a limited black edition which is processed with honey it's very unique and very good there's also this Katura tea I was just mentioning which is tea made from the coffee fruit I like to cold brew mine for 24 hours hours. Tastes a lot like black tea. Add a little bit of lemon, maybe some honey or some monk fruit sweetener. It's very good. Or you can hot brew it. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're drinking and whatever you're investigating, check out my sponsors and let's continue on with the video. Okay. I have a few questions just on your personal thoughts on, on why that guy is so untouchable. Um, and, and particularly why you think he gets such a pass from a lot of the corporate news. But so this, is this how you found out where you have your name and then it says former contributor, or did they tell you, you know, you're canned and it's because of this reason. So, so I put the entire narrative up at our open the books dot substack dot com uh, substack uh, environment. And so, Things changed when I wrote about Dr. Anthony Fauci. I'd been at Forbes for nearly eight years. I put up over 206 investigative pieces. Uh, just since 2009, there was 13 million page views on about 112 columns that I put up on our investigations at openthebooks.com. But when I wrote about Fauci being the number one most highly compensated, even though that piece garnered about 1 million views on the Forbes platform, things changed. And when I wrote about at the end of 2021, when I wrote about Dr. Anthony Fauci's all-time highest golden parachute pension, when he finally does retire, it's going to be north of 355000 
And then the U.S. Senate hearing happened, and I covered that, where Fauci said that his finances were public knowledge, and they weren't. We'd been suing on this for about a year at that point. And then finally, when Marshall, Roger Marshall, the U.S. Senator, got the 2019 and 2020 ethics and financial statements from Fauci on an unredacted basis, those had never been seen before. And I gave those oversight at Forbes. So Fauci made $1.7 million in 2021 between his government income, his wife's government income, his investment gains, travel perks, and other royalty payments. When I wrote about that, Forbes came down hard on me. Uh, Forbes came down hard on me after NIH came down hard on them. My column was terminated after I told the truth. And so what was the reasoning that they gave you? So first off, uh, even before NIH wrote an email to Forbes, my editor- Did you get that email, by the way? I'm just curious. Was that because that public record? What did, did you see what that said? Yes. And I, I posted it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking I'm here. Is this where people would, is this the article that you wrote about it or is there another one? That's the article that, that really kicked the, the hornet's nest. Okay. So, so yeah, after open that article, published. Um, after that article published. Yes. Yep. Okay. Keep going. Sorry, Adam. No problem. Uh, so after that article published, I received a phone call from my immediate editor saying, uh, you know, three pieces this close to one another on Dr. Anthony Fauci, you know, you, you can't write about Fauci any longer. And Allison, I was this, I'm the subject matter expert on Dr. Anthony Fauci's finances. So, mm -hmm. so I'm light to lift. I figured the columns are popular enough on, on Fauci and the investigation is robust enough. I can get those columns published elsewhere. So I agreed to that. And then he said in the same conversation that I would have to get every single topic cleared in advance before I wrote about it. That had never happened in nearly eight years with me. I agreed to that when I tried to get columns cleared. Over a 10-day period, they went silent, and then they wrote me an email saying that the next day the column was going to be terminated. So I never wrote another column again after I wrote about Dr. Anthony Fauci. Wow. So so what was it? I mean, I guess they just, it sounds like they kind of ghosted you. They didn't really give you a good reason, um, which, uh, you know, it sort of follows the vein of kind of the cowardly leadership that <laughs> seems to be um, pervasive in corporate news. But I mean, what, what's your thought on, on why, why this guy, I mean, why does he have the national consciousness, I guess, uh, sort of leaning in one direction? Like what, what, what is it about him? Um, you know, the, the media had no problem, like going after one guy named Trump for a while. Like there was no, you know, so I don't, so it's obviously like they don't feel bad about bullying somebody. Right. They, and, and I always tell my audience too, that, when they do it, it's exposing, like when they feel like it's, it's uh, the, the righteous journalistic path and they call it exposing. But when the outsiders do it, it's bullying or targeting or wh whatever. That's, that's, you know, you're un being unfair, or, you know, whatever. So I'm just curious, what do you think about that? Why, why him? So first off, Dr. Anthony Fauci was only a small portion of our oversight investigations at openthebooks.com. Since the pandemic started at Forbes, I put up 92 investigations and only six were on Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, however, what we came to learn is Fauci is protected, he's unreviewable, and he's probably unfireable in his position. So let's go back to 2004. Our team unearthed a memo that showed why Dr. Anthony Fauci is the most highly compensated. In 2004, Fauci received a permanent pay adjustment for his work on biodefense. So back in 2004, I really believe the United States government made a decision that Fauci was indispensable to the ongoing concern of the country. They needed to keep him on the team. And so they gave him, you know, this permanent pay adjustment. You can think of that as a permanent bonus all the way back in 2004. Now, this was privately saying that Fauci is untouchable and protected. But in 2008, President George W. Bush, he announced that publicly. He gave Dr. Anthony Fauci the highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So Fauci, all the way back over all these years, it's been known that you don't touch Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, he was paid the number one most highly compensated employee for his work on biodefense. And now we know he failed in that mission. 
can you explain what you mean by bio defense when it comes to his role? Right. So a lot of that is blacked out, but we do know. <laughs> he's he's know. like a mafia leader. I mean, all this sounds like we could be talking about the mafia. Well, the National Institutes of Health, they have a strategy and it's <laughs> anti-transparency. So here, here's the strategy, Allison. You file our organization. We use the Federal Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. to try to get information that we already own out of the National Institutes of Health. People already own that information. We paid for it. You have to follow a statutory process to take possession of it. We file these requests with NIH. NIH then ignores our requests. We've had to sue them twice, and we're getting ready to sue them two more times. They won't even respond to my Freedom of Information Act requests any longer. They drag you into expensive litigation. They have an unlimited checkbook funded by taxpayers, mm -hmm. and they use that litigation to slow walk. And then when they finally produce documents that are judicially mandated because they're public documents, they heavily redact those documents. So this is a strategy to use taxpayer dollars to keep taxpayers in the dark. All right, let's switch over to your latest investigation, Substack investigation, Fauci's royalties and the $350 million royalty payment stream hidden by NIH. What's going on here? So, you know, who knew, who knew that every single year, as we just talked about, NIH doles out $32 billion worth of grants. But our organization at OpenTheBooks.com just found that ten, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of royalty payments from the industry, think pharmaceutical companies, flow back in through another door, back into the agency to enrich the agency and 1,700 of its scientists who receive these royalties, including leadership. Former director of the NIH, Francis Collins, was receiving royalties, as was, as was Anthony Fauci, his deputy Clifford Lane, and other executives over at the agency. Now, Allison, every single one of those royalty payments could be a potential conflict of interest. All right, I'm going to switch you over real fast to my locals page because this is uh, sort of about Fauci and kind of what you were just talking about. If you're watching this somewhere else, you should check out allisonmorrow.locals.com, become part of my editorial board, then you can submit questions ahead of time for people like Adam. Uh, okay, so this person I think is a professor and was saying that Fauci gave one of the commencement speeches, this is the headline from it, Fight the Normalization of Untruths. And uh, then talks about how their students complain when they bring in opposing viewpoints to classrooms, which is a whole nother, probably a whole nother story. Uh, and we could talk about journalism school these days. But uh, but I'm curious, um, when you're talking about the, the flow of money in, in both directions, and we did already sort of touch on this a little bit, but how does that affect this idea that remember when Fauci said something like the attacks on him or attacks on science, how, how do you think the money influences the, this idea that, that he is sort of this archetypal figure um, among others, you know, not just the NIH and the government, because you were bringing up how the history of Fauci not being touched within the government, but, but outside when, when you're talking about this flow of money that you all have been tracking how do you think that affects this idea that he, that he he has the truth and that everybody else outside of his viewpoint is normalizing untruths? Uh, and I, I just ask that because, like in in my newsrooms, we never had discussions where journalists said we get a lot of money from big pharma, so we really just it's our job. Uh, we have this obligation today to be pro big pharma somehow the money was affecting the journalists in a way that was subconscious. It was, it was affecting them. Like they felt like they were fighting a battle. They were doing a service. And I don't think it in any way we're saying we know the truth to be a, but because we're paid by B, we have to do this. At least that was just not my experience of the average kind of stormtrooper journalist. So I'm just curious what you think about that. So there's a lot in your question, but let's kind of unpack it. First of all, uh, it is antithetical to the American experiment to have an elite popping up on television and telling you how many people you can have over for Thanksgiving and how many people you should have over for Christmas. So if somebody's trying to do that, as Anthony Fauci was, then he is subject as a government employee because we're paying a salary to oversight. And that is a basic bedrock American principle. Hayek called this the fatal conceit of the elites. 
And the entire American experiment is premised on our rights coming from God and not from government. And so, so you know, with millions of individual decisions, historically, that's been uh, more effective than elite top-down control. And we're testing all of those, those theories in real time during this pandemic and now in the aftermath of it. And so, and so let's, so to your point about, you know, can the royalties, this $350 million over the course of the last decade, influence public health care decisions over at the National Institutes of Health? And I think we don't know the answer to the question because we can't follow the money. Here's what's going on. Although I can see the top line numbers and I can see the names of the 1,700 scientists, here's what we can't see. NIH, on, on the production of these royalty payments, they blacked out, they redacted the name of the third-party payer. Think, again, pharmaceutical companies. So I can't tell you who's paying the royalty. And on an individual scientist basis, like Fauci, I can't tell you the amount of the royalty. I also can't tell you the uh, invention, the patent number, or the license number, because that has been redacted as well. I can't follow the money on $350 million worth of royalty payments over 10 years. They're acting like they have something to hide. Here's also what the record shows. In 2005, the Associated Press, they got the entire unredacted database. That's the last time this database had scrutiny, 17 years ago. And they found a scandal. Dr. Fauci had received $45,000 worth of royalty payments from an experimental age drug. Hmm. When, when the press got a hold of this, he says, I'm going to donate my royalties to charity. That was 17 years ago. <laughs> Just recently, in the past week, NIH was asked whether Fauci was donating his royalties, and they basically had no comment on it. Fauci didn't weigh in on it either. So we don't even know if he's donating his royalties. And even if he was, let's go back to 2005. Tax, Fauci admitted that $36 billion of taxpayer money was used to help create the drug, the drug that Fauci's name was on as a co-inventor. And, and the Associated Press found that Fauci was continuing to greenlit grants into further development of that drug, a drug that his name was on the patent. This is on its face, a conflict of interest. Fauci admitted as much, said he would donate Said, said he would donate his royalties to charity. His deputy said he wouldn't donate his royalties to charity. And Francis Collins also kept his royalties. This video has been cut short to fly under the community guideline radar on YouTube. So if you want to see the entire conversation, go to one of my other platforms. The links are in the description. The best place to go is allisonmorrow.locals.com where you can support my work and become part of my editorial board. We have editorial board meetings there once a week where you can give me feedback from the week before. You can get pitch story ideas for the week ahead. They're very small live chats. And so I definitely will see your comment and get your feedback. You also get exclusive content there. So definitely allisonmorrow.locals.com. But Whatever you do, don't stay here on YouTube. If you want the full truth about what's going on around us, you're going to have to go somewhere else.